plenty of seats up front. <laughs> extra, extra credit for sitting up front. All right, great. <laughs> it's Pavlovian, extra credit. All right. Uh, thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. We have a really great uh, program. I promise you this will not be your uh, average academic talk. Um, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, the Dresher Center for the Humanities and the Department of Media and Communication Studies. Uh, this talk is part of the Fabulous Humanities Forum series. If this is your first time coming to a Humanities Forum talk, um, they're all great and they're all really different and it's one of the one of the many benefits of being part of a university like this. I want you to uh, look at the flyer which we have uh, uh, available uh, and also go to a, a website, dressercenter.umbc.edu uh, to see the full schedule of things we have uh, for the rest of this semester. And every semester there's just a string of outstanding uh, talks um, and events uh, sponsored by the Dresher Center. Also uh, engage with the Dresher Center on social media. You can follow the Dresher Center for the Humanities on Facebook and at UMBC Humanities on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and the next uh, uh, event in the, in the um, Humanities Forum is coming up later this month. Uh, was it postponed from earlier? Yeah, so this is going to be um, the annual Daphne Harrison Lecture. It will be held March 26th. At 7 p.m. at the recital hall in the, is this in the, in the new building? Oh, in the fine arts building, in the old building. All right. Well, but it's going to be a good talk. Um, uh, the title of the talk is Race for Profit, How Banks in the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Home Ownership uh, by uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor, Assistant Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. During this talk, Dr. Taylor uncovers how the push to uplift black home ownership in the 1970s and the disaster that ensued revealed that uh, racist exclusion had not been eradicated, but rather transmuted into a new phenomenon of predatory inclusion. Um, it should be a really uh, excellent event. Um, okay, so now let's talk about today, today's event and today's speaker. Rachel Ida Buff is a writer and historian. She teaches history and comparative ethnic studies at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, where she also directs the Cultures and Communities Program, a public-facing component of the College of Letters and Science. She's author, most recently, of Against the Deportation Terror, Organizing for Immigrant Rights in the 20th Century, uh, published in 2017 by Temple, uh, and of the forthcoming A is for Asylum Seeker, Words for People on the Move, which also has been published simultaneously in Spanish, which is really cool which is due at Fordham Press on May 1st. I'm really excited about that one. Uh, both uh, books are available. You can purchase uh, Against the Deportation Terror right back there, and you can get a um, flyer with a 30% off coupon, something like that, uh, for A is for Asylum Seeker. Um, both are, are uh, uh, important interventions into one of the most important issues uh, dividing and uh, captivating the country and the world right now. Um, and I think this talk, uh, which draws from both books, uh, will be a really uh, great occasion for us to think and talk together about this. So join me in giving a warm UMBC Dresher Center Media and Communication Studies of Baltimore Honors University in Maryland. Welcome to Rachel Ida Buff. Thank you, Jason. Jason and I go way back. Um, not that we're that old, but we do go way back. And thank you so much for inviting me to campus. And thanks to the Dresher Center and to the Media and Communications Center. And for all of you all for coming out on a Thursday afternoon. One of my students from UWM is, is in the audience, which wow. is really cool. It's nice to see a, a familiar face. And it's nice to see you all here. Um, so yeah, I, I'm mostly going to be talking from my new book, which is A is for Asylum Seeker, Ade Asilo. Um, which, as Jason said, comes out on May 1st. And um, I wrote that book. This is a very bad, weird, scrambled version of the cover, which you can see better in the flyers. I wrote that book for everybody. Um, my other book, which is for sale here, Against the Deportation Terror, is a historical book 
um, that uh, my experience with that book, it's a story of uh, immigrant rights in the 20th century, immigrants rights movements, and it's dedicated to the immigrant rights movements now, few of whom know that they build on a really rich history. I should say that I'm an immigration historian and I have also been involved in Im immigrant rights organizing for the past 20 years. And I wrote against the deportation terror, I'm gesturing over there because that's where the book is, not that's where it's happened. Um, because in 2006, I participated in one of the uh, mobilizations against HR 4437, our Congressman James Sensenbrenner's um, bill that would have criminalized undocumented presence, it would have criminalized helping undocumented people. It was a terrible bill that galvanized immigrant rights marches across the country. So as I was marching through downtown Milwaukee with 40,000 people, I thought to myself, because I am a historian, gee, I wonder if this has ever happened before. And I asked around and no one knew. Yeah, I don't know, we've been working on it for a few months was the standard response. But it turns out that actually we've been working on it for, you know, 80, 90, 100 odd years in terms of mobilizing foreign born people against what they called, and this is a term I lifted from them, the deportation terror, which I think everyone in the room now is very familiar with because in a funny way, the deportation terror, particularly since 2016, though arguably over the course of the past 20 years, has become very familiar to foreign born and people who, are, who have less to fear from it because it's such a high profile um, way of making some of our neighbors and students and colleagues know that they're not welcome here and know that they have stuff to fear. It's the politics of fear, always current in American society, have really been coming to the fore in the past couple of decades. So I noticed with Against the Deportation Terror, which if you look at it has a really beautiful cover drawn by my um, colleague Raul Deal, I would get invited to book groups and stuff and people would be like, yeah, the book seemed really interesting. We didn't particularly read it. We really want to talk about what's going on, which was fine with me. You know, as a historian, you're kind of used to people not reading your books, <laughs> <laughs> including your students, actually. Um, but I also began to notice that we were all getting really confused. And I noticed in these book groups with um, Against the Deportation Terror that people were really confused about, well, what is an asylum seeker? And what's a refugee? And what does it mean to be illegal? You know, can a person be illegal? And what's the difference between a migrant and an immigrant? And I began to fantasize about a very academic project that would look at the antecedents of words like vagabond and vagrant and itinerant and trace them into the contemporary time. But at the same time, I was getting more and more drawn, particularly since 2016, into the politics of the moment and realizing that we are in a moment of emergency about these words. And I'll, I'll talk more about this, that a word like asylum seeker is a legal term that comes out of a human rights consensus that existed after World War II in the wake of the displaced persons crisis in which there were 60 million displaced persons at the close of World War II in Europe, in the wake of the genocide of, of Ashkenazi Jews and Roma people during World War II. The, the global consensus was that there needed to be some official legal way that people could seek shelter from those kinds of storms. That's what an asylum seeker is, but you really wouldn't know that in the mouths of some people at this moment in history because it is possible that asylum seeker sounds like a dirty word <laughs> involving criminal aliens and other bad hombres, right? And this is an intentionally sown, what I call a demeaning of language. So this book is an, an alphabetical intervention into that huge quagmire. It's 30 um, words that, have, that are used to, to define and explain the lives of people on the move in our current era. So the book isn't out yet. This is the very first event I've done about it. So you guys, you're, you're like the canaries in the coal mine and or you have the honor of hearing it first, depending on how you think about it. So I'm going to read some of it and I'm going to talk some of it. But I'm going to start with the very first entry, which is not alphabetical, and I had to fight for it in a little bit because Asylum Seeker should come after accompaniment, but I really wanted it to come first. So I'm going to read you Asylum Seeker, and then I'll talk a little bit about it. Oh, I should say that this, this work is based on what I would call applied scholarship. So I've been teaching ethnic studies and immigration history 
for my whole career, and I read and think about it, and I write archivally sourced books a lot. This is not one of them. And I also, through organizing in Milwaukee with the huge immigrant rights organization, Voces de la Frontera, to whom this book is partially dedicated and who will get a, a portion of the proceeds, if there are any. Um, but I also, um, particularly in the last five-ish years, have become more involved with questions of international um, refugees and displaced persons. And as part of that involvement, I've been um, working in Tijuana with an organization called Al Cholado, which I'll be talking a lot about. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll talk more about this as we go. So Asylum Seeker. Tijuana, Mexico, June 2019. I'm watching a toddler sleeping in her mother's arms. She's been running around the children's area at the offices of the Border Legal Service Organization Al Otro Lado all afternoon, busily building stacks of books and knocking them down, grabbing dinosaur puzzle pieces from outraged older children who were just about to put the whole thing together, running out into the rest of the room where eight folding tables accommodate asylum seekers, come to consult with volunteer advocates and lawyers about their cases. Finally, her mother picks her up and holds her in her lap. The little girl passes out, totally giving over to sleep. Her body, so antic a few minutes before, relaxes completely, her small hands splayed like a starfish at her mother's hip. I can't help but wonder whether this toddler will be able to sleep so deeply if she and her parents are able to cross the border into the United States. If she is allowed to remain with her mother, they will likely be put into a hilera, or icebox, a detention cell deliberately chilled to 55 degrees. Al otro lado advocates advise asylum seekers to wear their warmest layers closest to their bodies, sweatshirts under t-shirts, because Customs and Border Protection, CBP agents, confiscate every layer of clothing except the last. And if she is separated from her parents, what happens to a toddler who can only say a couple of words, like mama and papa, when they disappear? On any given night in Tijuana, there are about 8,000 asylum seekers, like this little girl and her mother, 60,000 if you add in all the border cities at the U.S.-Mexico border, waiting to cross into the United States. Many are Central American and Haitian, fleeing the corruption and terror bred by decades of U.S. political and military intervention. Others are Mexican from regions ruled by narco traffickers. There are thousands of Africans. I literally had to text my Africology colleagues, like, why are there Africans in Tijuana? And they were like, we don't know. I'm like Googling Camerons, Cameroon, Civil War, Cameroonians, Eritreans, Ghanaians, Sierra Leoneans, many of whom fly to Ecuador or Brazil and travel by foot, by bus, by boat, and train through South America to Mexico. The remainder are a migrant UN, Russians, Cubans, Syrians, Yemenis, Turks, to name just a few. Border crossing is regulated by an illegal system in which would-be crossers receive a number. They congregate daily at El Chaparral, a pedestrian port of entry into the United States. Accompanied by members of Los Grupos Betas, part of the Mexican Federal Institute of Migration, list managers read out the numbers of those who will be allowed to cross each morning. Or they read no numbers, and no one is allowed to cross. On the door of El Otro Lado, the last number called that morning is posted before the afternoon clinic begins. People come with their numbers, asking when it will be their turn. There's no way of knowing. Meanwhile, the migrant shelters in Tijuana are full. Some people manage to crowd into rented apartments. Some stay with family members. Others are left to sleep in the streets, to eat when they can. Downstairs from the legal and medical clinics at El Otro Lado, Food Not Bomb serves a free vegan meal every weekday at 5 p.m. They do a brisk business. Under both national and international law, asylum seekers are a distinct category of people on the move. Foundational documents in human rights law, such as the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, certify broad universal rights to flee dangerous homeland and receive asylum in other countries. International refugee law asserts the right of asylum seekers to cross into any nation, set one foot into any nation, ask for asylum, and then go about the legal process of trying to prove their claim to credible fear if returned to their nations of origin. 
The United Nations High Council on Refugees defines an asylum seeker as someone whose request for sanctuary has yet to be processed. At the same time that international law recognizes the right to seek asylum, it does not compel individual nations to accept asylum seekers. This contradiction impacts the fates of asylum seekers around the world. Forced to leave home by circumstances not of their own making, they have a legal right to ask for asylum, but no nation is compelled to grant it. Many, if not most, contemporary people on the move define themselves as asylum seekers. This fact indicates global histories of violence, dispossessions, and inequality. Asylum seekers fleeing the Middle East and Africa often board unstable vessels, hoping to cross the Mediterranean into, to refuge, refuge in Europe. Among them are people displaced by environmental degradation and civil war, as well as by the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Many of those arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border flee the devastation caused by authoritarian governments and austerity regimes fomented by the United States. Among the caravans of asylum seekers, many leave indigenous communities ravaged by resource extraction perpetrated by transnational corporations. Risking their lives on dangerous journeys away from their homes, asylum seekers face difficult odds. Between 1996 and 2016, the rate of asylum denials in the U.S. ranged from 60 to 80 percent. In the European Union, the overall rate of asylum granted to people on the move from all nationalities in 2017 was 46 percent. And these numbers are much lower if we start looking at what's been happening since 2016 at the U.S.-Mexico border. Globally, the odds are that most asylum seekers will also become detainees or deportees. This is a really important transition because the UNHCR in 1951 said anyone can set foot in a country and say, I have fear, credible fear and receive a trial. Nations have innovated since then to say you can set foot in the country, say you have credible fear, ask for a trial, and go, go be imprisoned while you wait. And I, I'll talk a little bit about that history. In the U.S., the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, URERA, institutionalized the practice of detaining asylum seekers in federal immigration detention centers indefinitely. The term asylum seeker is a temporary designation. It describes people on the move who aspire to become recognized as refugees and receive the rights and protections conferred by that word. Like refugees, asylum seekers are also migrants, a status that conveys far less in the way of rights. As distinctions between asylum seekers and other types of migrants erode, they strand hundreds of thousands of people seeking refuge in detention centers, makeshift shelters, and camps. At the same time, advocates circulate alternative ideas about the rights of people on the move. What did that little girl dream of as she slept in her mother's arms? And what world will she wake up to? So I'm going to tell you a story based on my work at Alocho Lado, um, which was last June. Um, so Alocho Lado is one of a few organizations that's doing work with, there's a number of NGOs in Tijuana and other cities. Hias is in some cities, not in Tijuana. Um, because as I detailed in the piece I just read you, thousands of people are coming, walking in caravans. Um, taking planes to Mexico City, taking boats, taking buses, and seeking refuge at the border by crossing into the United States. Many, many of these people walk in the caravans that we hear about in the news, and um, I'll be talking a lot about those. Um, and so at Alocholado, people are invited in. Our, our clinic starts um, in the afternoon, so we go to the different pedestrian crossings. People come to the crossings with their suitcases and their kids kind of every day, hoping that they'll get in, even though there's this whole um, monitoring system where people are given numbers. And it's kind of chaotic, but we hand out leaflets in four languages, English, Spanish, French, and Haitian Creole. Um, and there's always a call for volunteers who speak Arabic or Tigrit or, other, or many African languages that migrants speak. Um, and so migrants are invited to come to Alocholado in the afternoons for uh, pro bono legal clinic to hear Know Your Rights and to sort of get an overview of what they can expect. There's childcare, as I detailed in the piece I read you, and there's um, free food and a list of migrant shelters. So um, 
my work when I was there, because my Spanish is just okay, um, was to do what historians do, which is um, scan people's documents. So I'm used to scanning documents of dead people and nobody has very much at stake in it, except me. So it was really a very different experience to scan the documents of actual living people. Innovation Law Labs, which is part of, um, it's a Georgia legal um, outfit that it was part of a successful lawsuit that maybe we can talk about later against the uh, migrant protection protocol. They have a cloud service, so you can scan people's documents, like the picture they have of the time they got beat up in Moscow, or their uncle getting murdered, or um, the birth certificates of their children, because if you're going to get taken into custody as soon as you cross the border, it's really likely that your precious legal documents are going to get lost. So I, I spent time at the documentation center scanning documents. So um, I was kind of stationed at the you know, at a table at the door, and migrants come in and they eat something and they, they sit in chairs and there's um, charlas, short educational sessions in four different languages and sometimes five or six, depending on who's there and which volunteers have which language. So on the floor I was in the Spanish language um, instruction would happen, so I would be like getting ready for document scanning and a couple times a week this uh, therapist who lives in Tijuana would come in to do a session with the migrants. And they did what I'm told is actually a fairly common exercise. So there are all these people who just walked, say, from Honduras with what they could carry, including their toddlers, and sometimes, I'm told, parrots and cats. I did not see the parrots and cats, but I did ask about pets because I was curious. If you were fleeing, if you had to leave, what would you do with your cat? What would I do with my cats? Anyway, people are really um, we were trained to think about trauma-impacted interviews because people are carrying intense levels of trauma from the places they've left and from the trip they took to get there. So people come in and you can see it in their bodies. They're fearful and hopeful. And so um, they'd be sitting in these chairs sort of fearful and hopeful. And Mateo, the therapist, would do this exercise. He would say, okay, everybody stand up. Everybody would stand up. Then he would say, okay, everybody, pretend you're birds. So people would pretend to be birds. I mean, if I told you guys to stand up and pretend to be birds, you'd be like, oh, God, right? You know, I, I'm not going to do it. And then everybody else, you know, it's like that, right? So they were like, you're like, oh, my God, okay, all right, fine. But then they're, they're birds, you know, and that's, that's an inherently good thing, like, to think about being a bird. And then he would say, okay, find a nest with other people, like, swoop into a nest. And so people would find these little nests, and they, and then they would say, now you're birds again. So I just want to tell you that story because I'm still chewing on that transformation, on being allowed to witness that transformation. Because I think my through line in thinking about the caravans and thinking about people on the move is that I think we all need to attend very carefully what's happening to them because I think we can all be or become people on the move. And I think the caravans are an act of human solidarity that we need to study very carefully because I'm not sure we're clear on which of us will need those lessons and who of us won't. I think our national politics right now are predicated on the idea that many of us won't ever need that and I don't really think that's the case. I can say more about that. So these folks, many of the folks in Tijuana came in the caravans that we hear a lot about. Um, many of them walking wherever they originated. If people flew from Haiti or took a boat from Haiti or, or flew from Cameroon, um, many of the Cameroonians and Haitians arrive. Brazil and Ecuador are pretty uh, permissive about travel visas, so it's, you, can, you can land and then you can walk. And what you might observe from this map is it's quite a long walk. And when I asked people, so what was that like, they mostly shook their heads and said it wasn't very pleasant. It was difficult. Some people were kind to us and many more were not. And, you know, we're talking about places that are, have roads and places that are fairly uncleared and jungly. And what's important to note is that part of our national policy in trying to discourage the migrant caravans has been to send money to the Mexican um, 
police to various different countries. So if you're looking here, I know I'm supposed to be there to talk, let me just point like, if you did, so all of these countries are receiving US foreign aid that says do what you can to stop them. We don't really care. So that's not necessarily going to lead to much welcome. So why are people moving? Right? Why do people leave? Why are there these huge caravans turning up in places like Tijuana and Matamoros and dealing with the incredible difficulties that people do? Why are people packing up and going? So my basic working proposition comes from the Somali-British poet Warsan Shire. And she says, no one puts their child in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one leaves home because they just decided they wanted to. People leave because they feel they have to. But there's an old history of this, which really begins with indigenous displacement. I'm an Americanist, so I think of that as starting in 1492. But if you're thinking about other parts of the world, you might think about colonization in other places starting earlier. So this is a picture of the Pequot War of 1630, after which the Pequot tribe of Massachusetts, Pequot nation of Massachusetts, was told they could never call themselves Pequot again. They could not use that word again. Many of the survivors, and you can see the village being burned here, many of the survivors were sold into slavery in the Caribbean. And many of the rest became vagrants. See, this was the whole academic project I was going to do. There's like traces of it in the book. They became known as vagrants. These are the indigenous inhabitants of the land. But after the Treaty of Hartford in 1636, they could not call themselves who they were. They couldn't call themselves denizens of their nation. They were itinerants. So many Pequots find their way to places like New Bedford, where there are small multiracial communities of um, indigenous folks. There are enslaved and free Africans, all involved in the global whaling trade, which, if you've read Moby Dick, which honestly I haven't, but a lot of people do, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people around the world get, you know, get involved in the whaling trade. And in fact, so, uh, somebody was interviewed in the mid 20th century whose family had been involved in whaling, and they said whaling was a form of passport. If you were in the whaling trade, you, you went places on boats and let fewer questions were asked. So that's a really important motion to keep in mind. Pequot displacement and Pequots being known as itinerant peoples on their own land. And the thing about that is it doesn't end, right? So some of you may know the story of Berta Caceres, her face is on the signs on the right, who was an indigenous environmental activist in Honduras who was murdered by the Honduran regime in 2016 with a wink and the nod from uh, our, our government, which was Obama at the time, not yet Trump, um, because of our hemispheric alliances. Berta was a leader of the Lenca people. You can see them, org so group of Lenca organizing, whose sacred river is, has been threatened by an international development project. So indigenous displacement begins with European discovery and expansion and continues. And I think um, you know, Karl Marx calls that primitive accumulation, but I think that that's a misnomer on many levels. It's really important that many of the people in the caravan, the nationality most represented, Honduras, right? These folks, many indigenous people in Central America, in Honduras, Guatemala, you know, have to leave because their lands are either there's a military conflict or it's getting developed and the, the ways that they're living become impossible. So indigenous displacement. It's also really important that legally in this country, the fugitive slave laws, and I think many of you have heard about this because of the, the movie 12 Years a Slave and other sort of public popular culture recently, Fugitive slave laws said that any uh, slave catchers in the North had to be assisted. Police in cities like Boston and Philadelphia and Chicago legally were in, 
they were obligated to help the slave catchers or, and, and um, citizens had to help the slave catchers, slaves and freed people who had never been slaves, Africans and African Americans under the fugitive slave laws. And the first fugitive slave laws are passed under George Washington and then they come around again in the 1850s. So that everyone of color, people of color living in free states are jeopardized. A lot of this legal basis remains on the books even after emancipation. So when we get to anti-sanctuary city laws, right, when we get to mandatory police ICE collaboration laws, this is the antecedent, right? So one thing about A is for um, asylum seeker is I couldn't write the book about the contemporary crisis of language around migrants without talking about all kinds of people on the move throughout history. I had to talk about indigenous people. I had to talk about African and African Americans during emancipation struggles um, because the legal and linguistic precedents are, st were still, are still there. And then I guess most recently, um, the laws that I'm talking about, the sort of global human rights um, consensus after World War II around the displaced persons crisis and around the Holocaust, the European Holocaust of, of World War II. Um, and many of you will be aware that this idea of never again, right, which is, that is the global human rights moment of 1951. But it was quite a firestorm this summer when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez compared the detention camps at the southern border to concentration camps, right? And it precipitated a movement um, called Never Again, which is a Jewish movement, Jewish-led movement, though it's multi-ethnic and multi-racial, um, to close the camps and to end the, the regime of terror um, by ICE. Another really important precedent, and I mentioned this a little bit, is the United States engagement in Central America. So the dirty wars in El Salvador, US backed, you could go along here, okay? You could just talk about United Fruit. We could just call this slide United Fruit, right? Because the United States starts to back banana republics starting in the 1920s with United Fruit. Right, so countries like Guatemala and Honduras wind up having um, very, you know, American people involved in their governments. They wind up having railroads developed in their territory that are to ship um, bananas to North America. Um, so there's a long history of U.S. intervention in Central America that gets quite pronounced under the Reagan doctrine of the 1980s, which saw anti-communist regime in Central America, to quote Ronald Reagan himself, as the moral equivalent of the Founding Fathers. Under the Reagan Doctrine, the United States sent arms and advisors um, to what were thought of as counterinsurgency operations against people's liberation movements in Central America. And um, the result were fairly um, murderous, human rights abuses that became, um, there was wide consciousness of these in the United States starting in the 1980s, um, the Committee in Support of the People of El Salvador. There had been some um, international human rights work where American observers would go to regimes like Nicaragua or El Salvador and observe and come back and report the kinds of human, human rights abuses that were happening. All of this precipitates the first iteration of the sanctuary movement in the 1980s, where different American churches and mosques and temples, Jesse Jackson's Operation Push, the Iroquois Nation of New York State, declare themselves sanctuary places where people who are fleeing repression in El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala and Honduras can be sheltered. Now, we can talk about sanctuary because it's a really interesting question. It the idea of sanctuary draws on um, medieval church doctrine that sees the church as a sanctuary. You can't drag anyone out of a church. So it extends that idea. And what we've seen kind of since the 1980s are localities, 
trying to define themselves against federal policy. So many, many of the people fleeing Central America in the 1970s and 80s the United States immigration policy only sees them as migrants, does not recognize them as refugees deserving of asylum. The, the um, denial rate is about 80, 90 percent throughout the 1980s and the 1980s. And people of faith and um, people who are doing international solidarity say, this is not okay, this is immoral. We're going to shelter them anyway. You know, I think a lot of us, it's, it's, a lot of us are engaged with thinking about this. I know in my campus there's been a move for sanctuary campus. And these are really interesting because they're kind of, um, they build on a history that goes back to abolition when in cities like Chicago and Boston and Philadelphia and New York, abolitionists got together and said, you know, no, you, you cannot allow this person to be taken back into slavery by a slave catcher, right? Not, not in our city, not in our watch. The sanctuary precedent goes back to abolition in this country, right? Um, but it, it has an interesting and tricky legal history. Uh, we found when we were organizing for Sanctuary Campus in Milwaukee that our, the legal team in, um, of our administration, which exists to protect the administration, not the students, I learned that, um, kept saying, well, we can't because there's been an anti-sanctuary city bill in this state, and there hadn't. There were four attempts to pass one. Each time our immigrant rights movement turned 40 or 50,000 people out in Madison, and fought it back. But the idea of an anti-sanctuary city bill had been passed in many people's minds. We do not have sanctuary. Do you guys have a sanctuary campus? It's something to think about. But again, it's not ironclad because it's, it's kind of a strategic intervention by activists, and that's, that's sort of what it's always been, as are anti-sanctuary city and sanctuary state bills, and the kind of thing that have, well, I could go on. All right. During the Haitian refugee crisis of the same years, when many Haitians are fleeing the, re the regime of the Duvaliers, who are backed by the United States, Papa Doc and Baby Doc, very coercive regime, the United States, under Carter, passes the Refugee Act, which is human rights. It says we're going to have a number of refugees admitted every year. We're going to have a whole protocol for those refugees. It sets, sets up the ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. It brings the U.S. into compliance with international refugee policy. It's like one of the last Carter Acts. And my friend Carl Linskoog details this in his book, which is a great example of what, what, happens, what, can, hap what, what can happen when historians go to government archives. Because Reagan gets into office and they start digging around for, surely to God, we do not have to let in all these black Haitians under this refugee policy. Surely there's an out. What they come up with are two things that are still operative and worth knowing about. One is interdiction, and this is global. This is what Australia does, this is what a lot of, um, this is what Italy does in the Mediterranean. If you can arrest people at sea before they stick that one foot onto land, you can return them home, sight unseen. So you might have fl fled Port-au-Prince because the Tonton Macoute, the Duvalier secret police, threatened to kill you like they killed your brother. If we find you at sea, we're taking you back to Port-au-Prince. Um, and if you do make it to land, and this is pioneered with the Haitians, and then it sort of migrates, which is another really important thing about immigrants and refugees, that what's done to one group tends to be done to everyone, they start to temporarily detain the Haitians. We don't even have immigration jails at this point. They start to sort of just revive old prisons, Chrome Avenue in Miami, which is still operative, which at the time is on the, the fringes, and had a huge coral snake problem. I worry about this kind of thing, the coral snake issues. But anyway, they revive Chrome Avenue and they start just throwing Haitians in there. There's no provision for them. There's no facilities. There's just detention. And the idea of this is twofold, right? One is it's a deterrent. Well, they'll, st they'll stop coming. And the other is it's population management, right? It's really important not to overstate the effects of the current presidential regime, because this is something that's been building since the 1980s, right? And it happened under Democratic and Republican presidents. And the reason for that is private detention is incredibly lucrative for private corporations like CoreCivic and Geo Group that donate on both sides of the aisle, right? So this, this sort of starts, or it adds to, you know, what we could see as, as the, um, 
increasing incarceration in general in this country, it adds a whole new population, right? So where we are now, I think that the fear of the caravans that we've been witnessing is in one way um, founded because I think that what we're seeing with the caravans is another expression of popular resistance that found voice in many of the popular movements that the U.S. undermined in the 1970s and 80s in Central America and now finds voice with a migrant stream. So when I was in Tijuana the first time last January, I met this woman, Irma Garrido, who's really involved in refugee advocacy. And she writes, the grand exodus is the new revolution, a radically different path against capitalism and the intervention of the United States and Honduras in Latin America, a revolution emanating from the people against the oppression, exploitation, and marginalization. So I want to read you C is for caravan. January 2019, we drive south towards the border, our car packed with so many trash bags full of donated clothes, diapers, and household goods that the two of us in the back seat perch on top of them. The supervisor at Border Angels, a San Diego trans-border human rights organization in operation since 1986, assembled our caravan of volunteers and cars this morning. He directed us to go through customs and head to El Baratal, a former nightclub now repurposed as a camp for the thousands of people who have arrived in Tijuana and await their turn to cross the border. Then he hopped in his van and we peeled out, heading south down I-5. Nervous, we quickly lose sight of that van and the other cars, forget all about customs, blow across the border, and arrive at the camp two hours ahead of the rest of our caravan. Through text, the supervisor connects us with one of the caravan leaders, Felipe, who meets us outside the heavily policed gates of El Baratal. We park and Felipe looks into our car, organizing our cargo into neat piles on the seats and in the trunk. People drift out of the camp, chatting with us and asking if we have things they particularly need, like children's shoes and warmer clothes because it's chilly in Tijuana in January, particularly if you're sleeping outside. They tell us about their caravan experiences, the long overland walk, a parrot that made the trip on someone's shoulder, families left at home waiting for word about when it might be safe to come north and join them. A Haitian man tells me about his sea voyage to Brazil and his long journey from there, up through Latin America to the U.S. border. Why don't you stay in one of those other places, I ask him. He smiles, because I want to feel safe somewhere, he says. Together we wait for the rest of our caravans for over two hours. I'm struck by the grace and discipline of the pedestrian caravan members. Although they clearly need and want what we are bringing them, no one, except Felipe, so much as approaches the open car to look through a window or check out a size. The four of us driving the car that morning are unused to the protocols of safe caravan conduct. We lost track of the other cars, forgot our instructions, and got lost in sprawling Tijuana. But sticking together and following the rules is essential for collective survival, which is the origin and purpose of caravans. <clears throat> There's safety in numbers. It's safer to sleep outside at night if people take turns watching. It's easier to cross rivers if someone is standing on the riverbank reaching for your hand. Caravans are strategies for collective survival. Historically, caravans have often been associated with Roma people, South Asian origin people on the move who travel through Europe in troops of circus performers and craftspeople. Often persecuted because of suspicions that their traveling lifestyle relied on theft, Roma were categorized by the Nazis as racially unfit. Many died in concentration camps during World War II. Forced to leave their homelands because of repression or violence, caravans of people on the move create solidarity and safety as they travel together. Since 2017, a series of caravans organized by organizations like Pueblo Sin Fronteras have gathered on the border of Mexico and Guatemala and walk to the U.S.-Mexico border. Pueblo Sin Frontera states its purpose as accompanying migrants and refugees in their journey of hope and together demand our human rights. Through their collective migration and presence at the border, these caravan participants defy distinctions between migrants and refugees. Despite their rhetoric, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security treats the caravans as aggressive invasions by criminal aliens claiming that people on the move brought the violence and repression they fled as if it were a contagious social disease instead of a historically created condition. 
Irma Garrido describes the communal rights perspective of contemporary caravans as a revolutionary strategy by which people on the move protect themselves and assert their rights to survive and thrive. With their beautiful human acts of solidarity, perhaps the caravans can show us all how to inhabit our beleaguered planet. And I guess um, there's lots of stuff we can talk about, about policy, and um, I'm happy to take questions. I want to end with this poem by the Puerto Rican Jewish uh, poet Aurora Levins Morales. It's part of her poem, Red Sea. This time we're tied at the ankles. We cannot cross until we carry each other, all of us refugees, all of us prophets. No more taking turns on history's wheel, trying to collect old debts no one can pay. The sea will not open that way. This time, that country is what we promised each other, our rage pressed cheek to cheek, until tears flood the space between, until there are no enemies left, because this time, no one will be left to drown, and all of us must be chosen. This time, it's all of us or none. Thank you. So I totally skipped the, the heady policy slide, but I'm happy to take questions about that or anything else. Yeah. You were talking, you started by talking about the future, the technology. One thing I'm unclear about is the difference between the and the refugee. Yeah. Um, uh, what is the difference between an asylee and a refugee? So if you have refugee status, and this is really important because it's like, well, we need, to, we need to super extra vet the refugees. If you are accorded refugee status, it's because you were in a camp in a third country. So there's a country you're trying to get to, the country you left, and you're, like, for example, if you're Somali and you're trying to get to the United States, you are vetted in a camp in Kenya. Okay, so the US has refugee officers there, and they have you know, looked into your background, given you a health screening, you've had, you know, maybe some basic English, some basic orientation, you, and only then are you considered officially a refugee, right? And then you are flown under the Office of Refugee Resettlement to the United States and resettled, often in places very different than you thought you would wind up. That's a refugee. And that's a really important point because they have been incredibly vetted. You know, so this, this notion that refugees need to be better vetted and we, you know, one of the really powerful things that the confusion of terms has done is along with the travel bans, it's like we need to limit refugees because we, we're worried about terrorists. I mean, this comes up all the time. This came up this fall. We had a campaign to try and get um, the Milwaukee police to stop collaborating with ICE and we were in the office of the city attorney and he said, well, we have to have some leverage against the terrorists and it was like, where did you even get that word in this context? We're talking about a, a Mexican family that was taking their kids to school and the dad got pulled out of the car and arrested. Like, where does terrorism enter into that? But it's, it's been very nicely conflated in the travel ban stuff. Mm -hmm. So in contrast, an asylee, and those of us who are old enough to remember the Cold War, you might remember like the Bolshoi Ballet would be in New York and a ballerina would, would ask for asylum, right? So she's already here. She doesn't have any, you know, there's no paperwork on her, and she says, like, I can't go home. They're, they're going to persecute me. So an asylum seeker doesn't have refugee status yet, but is in the country. Long, I'm deleting a long thread of really policy e things, dot, dot, dot. But it's really important that we're now down to, in order to prove that you should get asylum, you can't just say, because everyone says it, right? Gee, they, they threatened to murder my 13-year-old. You know, the, the, the CBP is like, yeah, everyone says that, right? You have to be able to claim fear of persecution because of membership in a particular social group, right? So if they threaten to kill your 13-year-old because you're a Christian and you belong to a certain church, maybe. If they threaten you just because they don't like you, an immigration lawyer I work with sometimes in Milwaukee has had some success by arguing that truck drivers are a particular social group in El Salvador because they're under a lot of pressure from drug games, gangs to distribute drugs with their trucks. So this one truck driver was like, I, 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 I had to come because they threatened to kill my family and they beat up my brother. 
And the only reason Mark was able to win asylum for this guy was saying, well, this is a particular group. So it's not enough that they murder family members of yours. It has to be because, you know, and that, that is the winnowing down of what an asylum seeker is. We're now down to like kind of a clause in the UNHCR original um, discourse about asylum seekers. Like we're not, you know, this, this was the, this is a lot of things, but you know, one of the masterminds here is, is Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the third. you know, like really in terms of like, let's, let's really hone down what, what, what counts as asylum. Yeah. Would you say that the immigration laws that we in this country and like overall in the West have is inherently anti-people of color? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And what's interesting and important about that is, I mean, yes, in a like long historical way, because the jurisprudence that's mobilized against the Chinese, who are the first sort of recipients of xenophobic immigration restriction at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, that, interestingly, the plenary powers doctrine, which allows Congress to make immigration law, the antecedent is the, um, the Jackson, the Marshall Court decisions about Cherokee land. Mm -hmm. So the reason they can justify anti-Chinese laws has to do with Congress's ability to control kind of foreign populations, which is based on the way that they dealt with Cherokee claims for sovereignty in Jacksonian America. So like in terms of the long game, absolutely. <laughs> and also unimpeachably, right? You know, there are, Europeans in Tijuana seeking asylum. Did you guys know that? Have you like have you been told like there's hordes of you know voracious Russians coming to get you? Like it's it's just not talked about that much, you know, because immigration law and immigration policy and immigrants are racialized in the in the public imagination. So absolutely yes. Yeah. Hi. Finishing um, school in San Diego when the second wave of federal medals came at the end of 2018. So I remember very much crossing back and forth to Tijuana. And then when I came here, well, I would I would ask folks while I was there, like, ultimately, where do you want to go? Like, ultimately, where do you want to stay to going? And a lot of people were saying, like, Virginia. And, like, being in Southern California for six years, my, my imaginary of Central American Latinidad was Southern California. Um, and then I realized that actually the largest Central American population is here in the DMV area. And so when I came here, I realized, like while we were there, it was very much like crisis mode. You're giving people exactly what they need for, for the moment, but you start to realize that it's going to be ongoing for years, that you know we are going to burn out. Volunteers are going to burn out. Um, aid is going to burn out, but they're actually going to be there for years. And then once they cross, they're going to be in detention centers for months. And then eventually they're going to have other routes to go to. And so when I ended up here, um, you know, I realized there, there's so much work to be done here in, in the long run once folks actually end up where they want to end up. So I'm wondering in terms of preparing for years long, year long struggles in the future to provide um, better policy for the Scaravanitos who hopefully eventually do receive refugee status. Um, I'm not too familiar with policy, so I want to know like what policy should we be looking out for? What policy should we be working towards like pushing in the future to help the shift in um, like the immigration makeup that's going to be working for the next 10 years? Yeah, that's a really great an important question. So I want to offer, I answer it in a little bit on the ground way and a little bit you're asking for big aspirational things. I think what you're, what you're saying, that this is a long protracted crisis, and I, I really appreciate your attention to the fact that individuals burn out, organizations burn out. You know, um, I've been working with Fosa de la Frontera for 15 years and like there's always a frontline fight. You know, we're always freaking out because the governor just whatever declared war on sanctuary cities. It's very hard to do the day-to-day -day, like pro bono legal, teach English, get families settled, and um, I've come to know some refugee advocates in town, and a lot of it is individuals driving around making home visits. 
So, I mean, I would say on the ground, there's an image I really like that's in the book that's from the American Friends Service Committee, and it says, Sanctuary Everywhere, Protect Each Other. And I used to, at first, I wrote an article about Sanctuary and asked them if they could use an image, and they were kind of crabby about it. They were like, we're really not just talking about immigrants. We can't just think about immigrants. We have to think about abolishing um, incarceration and an ethos and a practice of community self-care. Like, really, how do we control our communities and center people's well-being and take care of each other. Those are like really deep questions that we're, we're oddly unprepared to think about. I think because you know, we're all pitched into like these, these um, very ideological political spaces. So I think like, I'm always really moved by um, organizations and groups that think intersectionally. So for me, Sanctuary Campus, of course, is about foreign-born people and the things that can happen when ICE comes on campus. But Sanctuary Campus also has to be about, because on my campus, we had Milo Sinopoulos, who came and made fun of one of our trans students by putting a slide of her up on the wall and, making fun, and victimizing her, right? That's a sanctuary issue, right? That's about people feeling safe on campus, right? You know, um, American Jews were at a funny place because we have sort of Ashkenazi American Jews, we've gotten to be considered white since World War II and all, but like it's kind of backsliding for us. Like my my thing is we need to throw in with you know Muslim students, you know, people who are easily targeted or less easily targeted need to figure out ways to make common cause and protect each other. And some of that is gonna be unofficial, not policy and awareness. And then the broader question you're asking about policy is a really good one. Um, you know, when I started this project, it's really true that even though the human rights moment of the post, post World War II period, like it's this, you know, now I'm like, it's, it was so beautiful. And actually, if you go back and read what the UNHCR said, they're like, everyone has, should have the right to travel. Everyone should have the right to education. You know, it's like, it's beautiful and it never ever happened anywhere. But it's also really messed up to have some people who get to be refugees and some people who get to be migrants. Because as soon as they make that distinction, the US is like, okay, well, we're gonna start clamping down on migrants because they're obviously just just terrible people, like they didn't need to leave. Like the idea is like if you're a migrant, you just came here for a better life, jerk. You know, like, mm. it's kind of, that's kind of, um, but you know, the creation, the elevation of one category is the, the, so I think we have to get rid of that distinction and say, look, I didn't read you the climate refugee entry, but like, we don't even know in this country, like forget, forget about like, I don't think there should be borders, but let's just say there should be. Right, within this country, like, what are you guys gonna do when Louisiana's here, right? When people are like fleeing Louisiana, like are you gonna have, have like in Hurricane Katrina, some people tried to get out of New Orleans to find c civilian brigades closing off bridges and saying you can't come into our community. Mm -hmm. These questions are for all of us, right? We don't know who the next climate refugees are gonna be, mm -hmm. right? It, and like, we're, let's, let's just say it's like America for America, Fortress Americans, I don't think that, but whatever, let's just like, Okay, so what about, what about the Mississippi Delta? Can those people come to Wisconsin? I mean, we better start sharing our stuff and get, or else we have to like really have a police state. You know, like, I mean, okay, Wisconsin, like I, I've looked at the climate map, maps, you guys, sorry, but Wisconsin's sitting kind of pretty and I'm right next to the Great Lake. I can walk to like Michigan from my house. <laughs> <laughs> ha ha, and you can't. You know, like really, is that what we're, because that's where we're gonna have to go or else we have to figure out, like there will be wars. There are wars about diminishing water, changing climate, right? The caravans are, to a large extent, climate migrations, right? So it would be good if we fix the climate, but meanwhile, we really need to be thinking about, I'm not, I, I don't have a great long, I, I have lots of policy thought. Do you want to refine your question a little? Because otherwise I'm going to talk all afternoon. No, I think that was great. Okay, <laughs> I'm happy to, to try and answer more, yeah. Because I used to live in Houston and uh, up there, and you know, people still going to the now, so I thought, like, Louisiana, why aren't you going back, and you know, things like that. But um, on what scale, like, what, how many refugees do you have, like, at the border there, like, because that kind of brings into the thought of what kind of facilities we create for them um, to, this, to the extent where at least they'll have some place while they have the process going to, to stay in, as opposed to, you know, not sending a one message across like, oh well, you know, the have is there, you know, as long as you can make it over there, you know, you'll be fine. So this situation, which was which is the 
result of people coming in caravans. There's 60,000 people now at, at the US-Mexico border who are living like this. And you know, this is actually pretty sprucey in terms of how it looks pretty good. Um, interestingly, and I studied up because I was afraid some Drusian asked me about this, so I happen to know this when I say it. You know, last week, a circuit court found the Remain in Mexico program, which makes people not come into the United States but stay in Mexico while their claims are being processed. A lot of the places people are, this slide comes from Matamoros, which is a really, really violent city where I think a third of the migrants who are living there have, have dealt with having a family member abducted by the criminal gangs. Right? So if you're living in a tent, not so secure, right? Anyway, the, the, a court said that the migrant protection protocol, so-called, remain in Mexico is what I'll, to a lot of people call it, is, is unconstitutional and wrong. Immediately, the Trump administration went and said, could you stay the decision because we cannot let all these people in, we don't have the facilities for them. So it's a really great question, like what do we do with the 60,000 people? For a while, Mexico has been granting some people like, and this is actually what the um, international human rights law calls for, temporary residence and work papers. So I met a, a Honduran guy who was like, I'm gonna stay here for a year, I'm gonna try and make some money, I've got an apartment, you know, I have papers to work for a while. So, you know, that's one possibility is like some kind of temporary um, acculturation, though Mexico as, you know, a pretty, uh, poor country cannot be expected to absorb that. Another thing that's happened under this administration is that Guatemala and El Salvador have become receiving nations, this is really one of these like Zen cons of crazy policy, receiving nations for people who left them. So if you're leaving Guatemala to claim refuge in the US, you can be resettled in Guatemala as a country of refuge, but you just left there, yeah right. So, um, but there isn't, no, it's, it's actually a good question, like what is the infrastructure? Because that would be another way to go. Right, so in Australia, a big island continent, there are many, many refugees coming from um, the Middle East and Southeast Asia on leaky boats in, in fairly terrifying circumstances. And um, this has happened in the Mediterranean too, but let me stick with the Australian example. So Australia doesn't want to be overwhelmed by these mostly people of color migrants coming to Australia. So what they've done is to contract with the island nation of Nauru, which is you know in the South Pacific, um, to house these people in detention camps. So if you're an Afghan, um, uh, if you're an Afghan uh, refugee asylum seeker and you survive the the sea voyage and you see the shores of Australia hoving into view. You can then be taken by the Australian National Guard to this island detention camp and offshored there indefinitely. You know, and we're seeing similar things in, in Europe where fewer and fewer countries even want refugee encampments. You know, so, um, you know, in the Mediterranean, the policy has been to interdict asylum seekers and, and dump them off at Li in Libya, which does not have a great human rights record. With, with asylum seekers and refugees. But you know, the, the impulse in the West, Western Europe, Australia, the US, has been to like prevent people from coming. Denmark, not Denmark you say. Denmark has, um, you know, Scandinavia has absorbed some refugees, but you know, there's all these, there's a city in Denmark, a, a suburb of Copenhagen where refugees are required, to, asylum seekers are required to stay. Their, um, their, their lodgings are police, their mobility is very restricted. This is a global crisis. I've talked mostly about the US because I'm an Americanist, but you know, there's the stuff that goes on here is going on all around the world. Jason? I can imagine a, a You're back, still awake? What? You're still awake? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I rested my eyelid once. <laughs> 15 years ago doing a talk. Except he was snoring <laughs> while rest was <laughs> Totally were. Anyway, um, this has been a very, uh, been very thought provoking. I'm imagining a student or a staff member or a faculty member going home and maybe talking to their family members about the talk as best that they can reproduce the main ideas. And then somebody who wasn't at the talk saying, well, you can't have a country without borders. Like that seems like a really important slogan that gets deployed in conversations that 
can serve to foreclose on anything that follows. So what do you say to that? Well, actually, the last chapter, the epilogue of the book is um, called The Right to Stay Home, which is a thing, right? Because if you think about all of the people I've talked about, again, the whole putting your kids into a leaky boat thing isn't about like, oh, I've always wanted to go to America. It's about, it's insupportable for us to live here, right? So just for one example, let's take the part of the military budget that goes to foreign military aid. Let's take that and turn it into humanitarian aid, right? Or, you know, idea, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Like my students in Milwaukee often want to say, you know, my grandparents had a union job, they had a middle class life. Now there's all these immigrants here and they don't. And so my whole, the whole semester is me saying like, yes, all those things happened at the same time but they didn't cause each other. In fact, the reason there's a lot of Latinx migrants in Milwaukee is the same reason that your parents don't have the union lifestyle that your grandparents had. NAFTA decimates small farming communities in, in Mexico. It enriches not communities in, in North America like Milwaukee, it enriches global corporations who you know, have maculadoras at the border, or actually that's like so 20 years ago, they had maculadoras overseas, not even, in, or they have them in Central America. They're doing really well. That's a policy that caused tremendous migration and economic suffering on both sides of the border, right? So I think that our thinking should not have borders, right? We should be thinking about you know, why are conditions, um, why is there a feminino side in Juarez for maculadora, young women maculadora workers? Why is that possible? And it has everything to do with international trade policy, right? There, there are whole, there's a whole movement in Mexico and Latin America that says, you know, if you would stop despoiling our economies and our countries, we, we, don't, we wouldn't come. I mean, I wrote the conclusion of the book this fall thinking about Bolivia, right? You know, that that was a country that had gone a pretty long way in terms of indigenous rights, in terms of women's rights, in terms of um, land redistribution, but the regime didn't endure, right? So where are the new Bolivian restaurants going to be? Because that's what happens, right? People have to leave, not because they want to leave Bolivia. Yeah? Um, so my research looks at, I do research in Honduras to Louisiana. So you know, that on Interesting. Yeah, so under migration. And I think you touched on a really important point, which most people don't think about, especially if you read the New York Times or any of the mainstream media, is this notion of land being at, this, at the forefront of why people are leaving, right? You hear gang violence and narco traffic. These are why people are coming to stop. So I think it's really central. It is issues of land, from palm oil to tourism industry and things like that are just pushing people out and displacing it and causing some of this violence. So I really appreciate you kind of centering and foregrounding that in the talk. Um, and I was just like, wanted you to maybe talk more about, you mentioned at the very beginning about uh, your applied approach, like how, like kind of your positionality, and you mentioned the word accompaniment, maybe for accompaniment, if you can elaborate on that and how you fit that into your work. Yeah, so um, applied scholarship is what my best friend said it was. After my provost, said, how are you? And I said, I just finished a book. And he said, it's not an academic book. I described it. He was like, that's not an academic book, is it? And I was like, well, kind of. And then she was like, it's applied scholarship. So I'm like, I don't really know what that is, but that sounded much better. It's applied scholarship. <laughs> what, what I take that as, as, and this is a book you can give your Uncle Frank, who always fights with you at Thanksgiving about, about there, we have to have borders, or the guy who always <laughs> asks the question when I speak in retirement communities, like, we can't let everyone in, can we? This, is, this book you can hand to them, or read to them, if necessary. Um, so my positionality, a couple of things. I didn't feel like I could be a, a decent immigration historian if I wasn't involved with these issues in the communities I lived in, right? So that, that's been work I've done my whole teaching career, and I've seen it as just part of the research. Um, and the other piece of it is like, you know, I think that as a Jewish person, I've done a deep dive in the, in the last five years into questions of homeland, which is a pretty horrible and vexed one for, for Jews for complicated reasons. And uh, I think the question of displacement and trauma around displacement is a really important one. 
And I see, I think immigration is always an intersectional category, like different people are forced to move, every group is. So I see those of us who have been able to settle here from different groups, it's only a historical accident that that was easy for us. So accompaniment is a word that comes out of the new sanctuary movement. You're probably aware of Ravi Ragbir in New York and, and his work and um, the idea, and actually that's adopted from Central American ideas of Archbishop Romero saying, if you're going to work with the poor, it shouldn't be a charitable relationship like you're giving them something. You get where the danger is and be, be near them and be around them and help them. So one thing they do in the New York New Sanctuary Movement that I think is really powerful is somebody has an, a check-in with ICE that can often result in, in deportation and they bring, oh, you know, 150 documented white people with them, changes the courtroom a little bit, right? So if the court's just thinking like, oh, it's, it's that guy and he doesn't even speak English well and you know, he's not white, you know, we're, you know, but like if 150 people, and this, again, this goes back to abolitionists did this, black and white abolitionists did this. Like, you, you want to take this person back to South Carolina? Well, 300 of us are going to come to the court with you, and we'll see how that goes. They were often armed. That hasn't happened. <laughs> yeah, no, that it, yeah, that's a whole other story that I tell in the book. We have time for one more question. Back there, you asked, you had your hand up. a lot of pressure. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of us cannot uproot our lives to go dedicate to these causes, but I was wondering if you could give an example of something that we could do. Because educating the public is very important, but it doesn't seem like, I don't like something additional besides that. Yeah, by no means do you have to go to Tijuana. Like, the border is everywhere. I mean, like, you guys, you know, in Milwaukee, like, we're really far in land, although we are by the nice body of fresh water that I mentioned earlier. But that means that we are legally, that, that we are a border community and that ICE and CPB have rights there because we're near this giant border of water, because we're near a water border. And you guys are just near this harbor, right? So sanctuary issues are really important, and as, as she was saying, huge Central American community here in DC, Baltimore, everywhere I speak. I went to go speak in Kalamazoo, Michigan, literally. You thought that was a joke, but there's really a place, Kalamazoo, Michigan, about these issues a couple of years ago. It was like uh, mid to late 2016, and people were like, there's a church rummage sale this weekend. It's really people selling their stuff so they can go into hiding. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to look very far. This is everywhere. And it's every different kind of community, right? Like, in the media, it's talked about as Latinx, but you know, there's, there's sort of a, a quiet crisis of the detention and deportation of African and Afro-diasporic migrants. In this. So like, I think just even knowing, like mapping your community, mm -hmm. like, you know, where are people, where, you know, where are students, right? Where are, you know, in Milwaukee we have, I only found this out from doing this work, the largest population of Rohingya refugees in the country. Most of them are getting social services through mosques, right? So having a map of that, like where is the work happening? And, you know, what is needed? And I, I would start on your campus because you know one of the things I love about learning about UMBC from Jason all these years, and we think of UMBC and UWM as sort of related kinds of urban public campuses. You have stakeholders in these groups on campus. You have, you know, in, on, on our campus, not only do we have students, our engineering department is mostly foreign born faculty members, many of whom working in pretty challenging work conditions and terrified to say anything because their papers are dependent on you know, maintaining things at work. So I think just mapping and knowing about that stuff, you by no means have to buy a plane ticket or even a bus ticket. Like really you could walk around this campus and try and figure out, you know, where, where are the vulnerabilities and who's serving those populations. And I've been really impressed with student organizing around the, those things on my campus. Beth wants to jump in. I just want to say that CASA in Baltimore and in Washington, they have an organized accompaniment program so that you can help go with people to meetings they have to go to with ICE or to the detention hearings. Yeah, there's, there's definitely detention visits. The accompaniment stuff that New Sanctuary Movement has been modeling, like I like it because you don't have to really know anything. You just show up and like, you know, assuming that you're documented, that, you know, the volume of documented people witnessing some things has had really powerful results. Because um, 
this kind of power that we're seeing, the kind of repressive power that we're seeing in this country really doesn't like too, sh too bright a light on it because it's disgusting, right? So we can all shine that light. Also, the International Rescue Committee has a Baltimore headquarters, rescue.org, and uh, friends of mine have served as, um, as guides to recently settled refugees to help folks get driver's license, navigate some of the bureaucratic processes of getting jobs, learning how to drive, getting a license, uh, filling out a rental uh, a lease. Uh, so that's stuff you can get trained on easily. And it's a pretty couple of hours a week after that. It's a pretty small, well, it's, a, it's, an, it's an important thing uh, and it's doable. My friend Kai in um, Milwaukee is native born, um, but really interested in refugee stuff. And she, she did all these home visits for populations that aren't being that well served. And what she realized is she'd be in some, some family who had just gotten there who owed, you know, lots of money for their trip from overseas. And they would serve her this lavish meal. She was like, I gained 25 pounds doing this work in a year. So she started this thing called Tables Across Borders, where once a month, a group of refugees cooks, um, and we, they, she sells tickets um, to people who want to come eat you know, all these different foods. And the money goes to helping the refugee chefs start businesses, catering. And the next thing is she wants to start a boutique. Um, and that's something like, like this amazing woman invented it. She was just like, well, you know, and I started talking to some friends who had restaurants and let me use the restaurant once in a while. And now there's this whole thing that's happening. It's, and it's, it's bringing delicious food, it's bringing people together, and it's also bringing, suddenly people are like, oh, I didn't know we had Somalis in, in Milwaukee. You know, so there's so much creative things to be done. I just, I just wanted to add to that. We have something similar in Baltimore called Mirror Kitchen Collective. Mm -hmm. yep. It's run, it's a woman-run worker cooperative, and a lot of the women are refugees from various countries like Jordan, Sudan, uh, Honduras. And it started by them seeking community and cooking together. And now they uh, cater. Um, and if you're in the Baltimore area, they are at the farmer's market under the JFX Bridge on Sundays. Good and, food. And they have really good food. <laughs> and I also think just talking about this, like, if you, know, if you talk to your groups or those of us who are grad students or professors, if you talk about this being an issue, people come to you and talk to you about it. You know, like I think there's a lot of people on our campuses that are living kind of in the shadows a little bit. DACA recipients right now, like when did they announce that they were going to try and get rid of the DACA program? It was the first day of school in 2017. So like it's not bad enough that you have to go to freaking Target and buy stuff, right? You have to like think about not being able to go to school anymore. That was intentional, mm -hmm. right? And so those people are carrying tremendous anxiety. You know, and so just being someone who, who mentions that, people will come to you. Okay, let's give her a... Yeah,